Hey everyone, it's Steph here back for more texturing and tool bag with our deep dive into texturing this cargo ship model. In the last video, I covered many ways I love making and using carved groups to add material depth to the metal and paint. In this video, we're going to go over some of the final texture polish, which will include things like dirt and grime, specialized materials for the glass and rubber, heat coloring on the engines, and all of the cool little text decals seen on the concept here. I'll also quickly drop in some emission for the lights too while I'm at it. First, let's go over some of the ways you can add these little text decals. The easiest way is by using a paint layer. I made all these details in an external program and saved them out as square texture masks. I can drop this OSY texture into the stencil box of the paint tool settings window and this will make it overlay onto the screen like so. With this, I can just brush in the unmasked section, which will paint the decal onto the mesh. But have you ever tried using planar UV on a fill layer before? If not, I found it could be a really neat way of applying materials to a model. To start, I'll add a white fill layer and set the mask to fill black. Inside this fill mask, I'll set the fill layer projection method to planar and load my texture into the mask texture input. This is a tail number, so I just need it on the tail. So in the layer settings, I'll roll out the transform tab and set the scale to a low number. It's smaller, but it's also everywhere. To fix this, I'll toggle on this clamp setting to keep the texture inside the bounds of the transform box, which will make the next part easy. Now I can use the translate gizmo to move and scale this little texture over to the tail part. The one downside is that it's got super duper x-ray vision and just appears on the back faces of the mesh. I'll need to mask that using a paint layer filled with white and then use the black parts of this decal to cut out the text from the white layer, completing the mask. So first, I'll use the marquee selection tool to draw a box around where the text is that I want to stay visible. Then, with my paint layer selected, I'll use the fill tool to mask it with white. Because the selection tool has viewport shadowing on by default, the selection actually won't grab surfaces other than the one directly in my line of sight. After moving the paint layer under the planar layer, I can cut out the text from the white box by setting the text layer to multiply. Now the tail number is only showing up on the tail winglet. This is just another way you can approach constraining black and white masks to areas as opposed to just masking the layer. While these are all great ways of adding text, let me show you a more flexible workflow that I love which of course uses vector layers. Don't worry, I don't mean by drawing out the text letter by letter. Instead, I use the brush mode on a vector layer to load in the image I want. So here is a new vector layer, set to brush mode. In this one, I'm going to head to the albedo channel and load in this oil change sticker I so very lovingly crafted. I even filled it out. I learned a bit about aircraft oil types by doing this. The stuff 3D artists get to research and learn is one of the coolest things about this profession. Anyway, I'll set the roughness to a dollar value and set the bump to be a bit raised. The important thing to make sure I toggle on is the fit to brush option in the settings. This will bind the material settings of this layer to the brush scale. Now I can put the brush alpha into the brush mask input here and that should do it. Now I can increase the brush size a bit, set the hardness to 1, and draw a vector line. There's the decal texture neatly placed. I can adjust the brush spacing to only show 1, and then tweak this point here to orient it however I like. I can even move it. Vector layers are non-destructive, so I find these to be the best way to add stickers and text. Let me go in and add the engine intake decals by creating a new vector layer set to the solid vector mode. Using the pen tool, I'll just draw out the shape carefully for both the front and back engines. I'll adjust the points as I go and then make sure I turn on symmetry on the vector layer so that it copies over to the right side engines. 
make it a nice visible yellow too. That way as I set up some more text layers, they can be shown easily on top. That layer is going to be the Intake Text Decal Vector Layer. Just like the sticker, except after I drag on the default brush onto the vector layer, I'll change the brush mask to the black and white intake texture. Then I'll set the layer to albedo only and color the text with the albedo color. Now I can draw these on and move them in place using the line tool. I just got to change the brush settings a bit to remove the brush fade with the hardness set to 1 again and the spacing set to 2. Once that's placed, I can duplicate the spline and then move it in place with the transform shape tool for both sides of the chevron. Once that layer is done, I can then duplicate it and swap the texture for a danger sticker and clear the shapes list to draw in new danger decals, one for both engines. Adding decals this way is super quick as you can see and that's why it's my current favorite way to add them. Righto, that takes care of the decals. I could add so much more, but I want to move on to adding the grime layers. With all the extra paint details I added in the last video and now the bump detail on some of these sticker decals, I'll need to update the sync point data of the layer stack. So I'll do this by adding a new sync layer on top. Now the grime I'll be making will get into all of those new nitty gritty material details from the paint carve groups. The first grime layer I'm going to make is General Dirt. I'm going to throw this dust material into the layer stack and just leave albedo and roughness. I'll change the color to be a nice orangey brown and whack in a color mask black to start our masking process. The first thing I'm going to do is make use of the Dirt Processor layer, which will drop dirt onto the model in a logical way. This is an efficient way to set up a dirt layer straight away. I need to drop a grunge map into the texture input here, so I'll grab this stained brush texture from the library and drop that in. Changing the grunge scale will bring it in line with the rest of the layers. I will have to drop the direction intensity just to stop it look like it's been wrestling mud crabs in far north Queensland. And then change some of these contrasts to tidy it up a little, especially the occlusion and curvature contrasts. I don't need it to be super brown in every panel line. Right, that's pretty cool, but dust also falls on the top when it's kicking it up doing VTOL, so I need to drop in a directional layer top down here and set it to add. I'll adjust the contrast a bit, then chip in a dust speckle texture from the library to make it look a bit more like dirt. Let me set this to overlay, and that should blend nicer with a directional map after a few tweaks. Awesome, that's one main grunge layer out of the way. And shout out to the sync point too, as it's great for enhancing the grime and dust masks. Next up is making an oily grime layer that requires a bunch of hand painting for a more targeted oily grime. This is going to use a flat fill layer with a dark stained grey colour, maximum roughness enabled and the rest can stay off. Right, I'm going to add a paint mask black to start painting on my stains. I'm going to make a quick streaks brush by going to the tool settings window and setting the size to use the fade modifier. If I draw now on the ship, you'll see that that line will taper at the end of the stroke. Next, I'll set a lazy mouse amount to help keep my shaky hands steady and change the opacity to a low number. Now I'll start painting in some streaky stains all over the model. A lot of the streaks are around things like leading edge surfaces and areas where air condenses behind flow disturbances on the aircraft. To help me out, I can also use the stencil mode on the brush settings to overlay this leaks heavy black and white mask onto the screen. I can then just align that using the camera or the stencil transforms in the brush settings to where I need to paint it in with the default brush. Bam! And the dirt is there. And there. And here. <laughs> this way I don't need to use the fade or my shaky hands to paint in straight streaks. So with the heavy streaks out of the way, I can jump over to general staining streaks. 
These are messy patches that bleed out over time. I'll set up a soft streaky base layer by dropping in the streaks texture from the library and adjusting the tiling. Dropping the edge fade will help stop the crisscross appearing too much. Inside this, I'll mask this layer with a paint mask black with a blur layer above it so I can paint where I want this to appear. I'll be back in a jiffy as I run around and paint these all in. Ah, hand painting all these stains definitely takes a bit of time, but it really adds to the quality of the model. There is technically one more grime detail I've missed, and that's the engine exhaust. I kind of want to do that grilled chrome look that some of the kitted cars have. They just make me happy when I see them, so I'm going to see how that looks. <laughs> okay, I'll drop in this chrome brushed material, then up in the toolbar, I'll set the mesh select tool to select the engine tips. That way, when I use the paint mask black option on the group, it will automatically fill them all in for me. I'll create a new paint layer, then I'll clip it into the chrome layer. This way, I can adjust the albedo color at the tips of the engines towards a black gradient. Once I've enabled symmetry, I'll start this paint job with a hand-drawn gradient using the gradient tool in the toolbar set to only albedo to get a foundation going. Now I can use the paintbrush with a lowered opacity to add some variation. Once I have enough of a gradient from white to black going, I can use the gradient map adjustment layer to remap the grayscale colors to a new set of gradient colors. Kind of like how I showed how carb groups work in our previous videos. I've dropped it above the paint layer and will start slapping in some colors. Because the ends are black, I need to change the black color to a blue, then work my way towards white. I won't replace the white, as I need to control where this effect wants to end. Once this looks half decent, I'll drop in a blur above my shoddy paint job and get a nice gradient on the paint layer. Now I can go back and edit the paint layer to adjust the underlying gradient, and it will update the colors automatically. Awesome, this makes me really happy. All the grime is done and it was totally worth it. The next few things I need to drop in is the rubber for the wheels, which is really easy because that's just dragging a library material right onto the wheels like so. Also, I need a glass material on the targeting pod. This time I'm switching to the material tab and then I'll drag this glass material inside the library over and into the material window. From there, I can drag that material onto the cargo ship's targeting pod glass mesh. I cannot stress enough how important it is to keep separate shader materials on separate meshes, unless your tech artist gives you permission. Always chat with your tech artist friends. Right, so this new material is on the model, but it hasn't been linked to the texture project. So I can just drag it right onto the texture project like so. Now it's part of the list and the textures will get linked to it. But now that I've done it, I actually don't want it anymore. So I'll remove it from the project. Why? Because if I link it to a texture project, I then need to enable refraction and all these other textures the glass needs to look like glass. Each active map slightly reduces texturing performance. So in the case of keeping this as clean as I can, I'm going to make an executive decision to not do that. I'll just use the great textures that come with this library material instead. The very last thing I want to add is some emission for the lights. Here I'll add in the white light on the three spotlights at the front, dragging them onto the middle lights material ID color like so. I only need albedo and emission turned on for these layers, so I'll set that up. I'll make a new one for the green slugs and laser pointer. Nice and green albedo and emissive. In my head, the glass makes the light green, so it's also green when turned off. I, I don't know. Lastly, I'll duplicate the green layer, remove the color selection mask, and switch it to red. Albedo for the off color and emission for the on color. Drop that onto the top position light and the right wing will also be affected. I'll switch to the material window and make sure the emission is set to fluorescent and is bright enough. 
Switching this to ray trace rendering really helps show it off. Emission always makes lighting fun, which is exactly what I'll be including in the next and final video in this series. Lighting, render setup and even making animated fire. So make sure you give a like to this video and sub to the channel too. That way you shall be notified of any new tutorials and cool stuff as they come out. I'm going to go stretch and you should too. Cheerio friends!